In this video, I'm going to cover several of the steps in the Eightfold Path that the Buddha suggested leads to enlightenment. And it can be real difficult to get at these, and I've done so many videos on them, but I'm going to do another one. And so we hear of right uh, livelihood, right uh, action, right intention, right speech. And we're not really sure exactly what it means when someone says right. And so I'm going to go into that a little bit in this video. And I'm going to start off with a cognitive version of this. Uh, if you've ever read Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, it's interesting that when someone approaches us with a problem, we have two ways to react. And uh, one is thinking fast. And this is the kind of base level, innate, what I call mind program ego that we have installed in the brain. And it's there as an evolutionary tool, but it makes all kinds of mistakes and is generally angry. It's generally um, paranoid. And it's the one that causes so much of the conflict on this planet. And it doesn't just cause us conflict between people. It's the same thing that causes us conflict in our own skull. And so mind is what causes the conflict within mind. And this is why, um, you know, it's a fascinating study where people were simply left alone to their own thoughts. And people literally had the opportunity to shock themselves. And most people said, well, there's no way people are going to do this. And people actually sh gave themselves a mild shock rather than simply being alone with their thoughts because being alone with their thoughts was so conflictual. And the mind seems to always stir the waters if it's given the opportunity. Uh, thinking slow is that contemplative, reflective, uh, kind of jumping out of the program of mind that human beings are also capable of, but also something that takes a lot of time and energy to achieve. And so it's interesting that some spiritual leaders have taken this approach. And so when someone addresses them with some kind of conflict and says, look, you know, um, here's a really big issue. You know, this is one of these, again, what I call reality hooks. And these are things that seem to draw us in so much. They need action that even if this is a simulation or a dream or an illusion, these seem to cause so much suffering that they, they, they call on us to either act or somehow um, do something uh, because the suffering seems to be so great. And of course, well, okay, well, we want to act, but what is right action? And so while they're going off and meditating may sound very passive to a Westerner, what they're really doing is creating that energy level. Instead of reacting from that thinking fast mode, they're actually reacting from a different energy level. And when you react to that different energy level, it's so fascinating that you get a different energy level that responds. And so I have a friend who does social media and he's very popular and uh, he always pushes the boundaries, you know, and he ended up offending someone. And instead of just writing him and saying, well, you offended me, you need to take this down. And in, in other words, instead of responding from that thinking fast mode, clearly she had gone into some uh, contemplative, meditative, she, had, she approached it at, at a very interesting energy level where it was clear that she had thought about this. She wasn't uh, reacting. She was, you know, engaging in a much higher level of energy. And, and his response was exactly that. In fact, he took the post down because the way she had responded to him. Um, and it's, just, it's what we see so much in, in ter terms of human interaction. It's the same thing with mind and mind. If I say, don't think of the number 13, that's all you can think about. If I say, if I tell you, you must think of the number 13, then we sort of, you know, maybe for a few seconds, then we get distracted. So it's a very interesting thing. The mind is like a mirror and it seems to reflect the energy that it is uh, confronted with. And she had clearly uh, engaged him at a different energy level. And so the point is, is that, yeah, there are these reality hooks, these things that take place on this planet, whether it's a dream, uh, it seems like we, we need to respond. But the whole point is, what was the Buddha getting at with right action, right intention? It was responding from a level that simply was not this program of mind that is very um, instinctual, very uh, rule-based, very inflexible. And when we respond at a more uh, contemplative, meditative level, and I don't know how to talk about this um, outside of saying possibly the soul, instead of you're responding with ego, you're responding with soul. And you say, well, it's true, you know, Nibar's been throwing the soul word around a little bit. 
what in the world do you mean by responding with soul? Well, the whole interesting thing about using a phrase like that is um, it's beyond any empirical definition. It is by its very nature a mystery. And so there's some mysterious quality that is unknowable. And for if you get caught up in the thinking mind, the thinking mind believes there's always an answer. There's always a definition. There's always some way to uh, point to exactly what it is that you're talking about. But when we get to uh, the mysteries of human existence and really you know thyself, Am I an ego or am I a soul? Well, ego is pretty easy to map out. I mean, that's what psychology has done. They've mapped out the human mind and the human ego, all the mistakes and errors that it makes. But who we really are, and, again, and I guess that's what this gets down to, you know, instead of reacting in life to a situation from a program based on the survival of your own ego, uh, react with something far greater, more vast, more mysterious. Uh, get a soul reaction. And when you do that, other souls respond instead of other egos.